Liberty or Equality? The Challenge of Our Time. Eric von Kunolt Ledeen. 1952. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Chapter 3. A Critique of Democracy. For the few shall save the many or the many are to fall still to be wrangling in a noisy grave. E. A. Robinson, Demos. The belief that the liberty of the people can be guaranteed by parliamentary government has ceased to exist for some time. The world is fed up with parliamentarism, but nobody has a better solution, and the knowledge that this despised institution has to be carried over as a necessary evil into the 20th century fills the minds of the best of our contemporaries with anxiety. Edward von Hartmann. 1. The Basic Problem. In our investigation of the modern pattern of democracy, as in every other analysis of political phenomena, we should always remain firmly grounded on philosophical soil, yet never lose sight of the historical realities, in the widest sense of the term. Don Luigi Sturzo in one of his essays very correctly says, Philosophy and history will always remain two branches of one knowledge and speculation of man. If their convergence and reciprocal influence ceases, philosophy becomes sterile tautology and history an incoherent succession of meaningless facts. Which reminds one of Diodorus' statement, I.2, history is the fatherland of philosophy. The record of democracy has been of an entirely different character in Protestant as compared with Catholic nations, not to mention the examples of democracy in antiquity. We are convinced that religion, or, to be more precise, the character of a culture's religious basis, is the most important element in determining the affinities between nations and political forms. The success of specific political forms depends on the closeness and harmony of such affinities. The interrelation between democracy and religion will be dealt with in Chapter 5. We know very well that there are also other factors involved, as, for instance, a collective historical experience, as well as historical memories, the influence of geographic environment, i.e., geopsychological aspects, economic realities or, in given moments, the charismatic qualities of outstanding rulers, leaders or demagogues. It is extremely difficult to establish a valid hierarchy of these factors, but we are inclined to put the religious realities first and the geographic element in second place. Race, for instance, would figure a great deal lower in our tabulation. And last, but by no means least, there is always an X of a purely historical character, in which even accidents play an important role. In our introduction we have alluded to the fact that the main difference between continental, primarily Catholic, and Anglo-Saxon, primarily Protestant, representative government is to be found in the important alloy of the latter, Whiggery, or liberalism in the classic sense, which has so far been the inseparable concomitant of Atlantic democracy. The vast majority of Americans and Englishmen talking about democracy always include the element of liberalism in their concept of it, and this, as we have noted before, in spite of the fact that democracy and liberalism are concerned with two entirely different problems. Democracy, let us repeat, is concerned with the question of who should be vested with ruling power, while liberalism deals with the freedom of the individual, regardless of who carries on the government. A democracy can be highly illiberal, while on the other hand an absolute ruler could be a thorough liberal, without being for this reason the least bit democratic. Even a dictator, theoretically, could be a liberal, see above, pages 3, 10. Though admittedly the likelihood of a modern dictator having this propensity is very small because, as the leader of an ideologically inclined mass party, he will have strong majoritarian, and thus totalitarian, tendencies. A purely military dictatorship based on the bayonets and sabers of a handful of professional soldiers has greater liberal potentialities, one has only to compare Franco, Oliveira Salazar and Peta with Hitler, Mussolini and Stalin. It should be self-evident that the principle of majority rule is a decisive step in the direction of totalitarianism. By the sheer weight of numbers and by its ubiquity the rule of 99% is more hermetic and more oppressive than the rule of 1%. Of course unanimity, which was an early medieval principle of government, is not oppressive. Yet the question remains whether unanimity does not, in a sense, obviate rule. Psychologically, rule stemming from a person considered superior is less oppressive than coercion exercised by equals, not to mention that exercised by those felt to be inferior, even 51% of a nation can establish a totalitarian and dictatorial regime, suppress minorities, and still remain democratic, there is, as we have said, little doubt that the American Congress and the French Chambre have a power over their respective nations which would rouse the envy of a Louis XIV or a George III were they alive today. If we accept different categories of existence in regard to democracy and freedom, which is the postulate of liberalism, we have to ask the question whether the two principles of democracy, egalitarianism and majority rule, are actually and teleologically compatible with freedom.
Fisher Ames denied these possibilities. The Western, liberal Democrat is convinced that the democratic process is the best means for the safeguarding of liberty, assuming, somewhat arbitrarily, that the vast majority of the people, the macrocosm of the average man rather than of the common man, aspires to liberty. Now liberty is, as a matter of fact, an intermediary end, a condition, or precondition, rather than an ultimate goal. There are certain ends which presuppose the existence of liberty, which itself is, for the purposes of our investigation, of necessity relative and not absolute. These specific ends we have in mind seem to be predominantly of a non-material nature, of a human, not an animal nature. Although it cannot be denied that mankind, by and large, prefers a subjective feeling of freedom to coercion, we also know of a craving for material goods which frequently can only be satisfied at the expense of liberty. Conversely, we know of freedoms which can only be preserved with sacrifice of material values. This is a tragic dilemma which neither the Manchester liberal nor the communist wants to face. Nor must it be forgotten that it is by no means easy to draw the exact line in individual cases. The profiteers have frequently paid lip service to the ideals of freedom in order to gain purely material advantages. Still, freedom is the average man's indispensable precondition for the development of his personality, of course only the saint, that is, the person accepting death and poverty, is free at all times, and thus also of his deeper, implicit happiness, which does not necessarily rise to the surface of his consciousness. Gouda's lines remain eternally true. Hoxtis glut der Erdenkinder first doch die Persönlichkeit. The highest happiness of the children of earth is personality. There is, needless to say, also another equally well-known dilemma which knows of no practical solution, the problem of the toleration of error, to which we will refer in chapter 5 of this study. Akin to this problem is also the question of the toleration of propaganda and agitation attacking the very foundations of a state. This dilemma in a political democracy with a liberal society is completely insoluble. If, for reasons which we will discuss later on, we insist on freedom of discussion, we must sacrifice either one thing or the other. The wise liberal, in our opinion, will part with political democracy, the democratic doctrinaire with the liberal society. Those who insist on all three elements will sooner or later have to face the rise of a totalitarian dictatorship. If we investigate the propensities of the masses we find that they frequently sacrifice freedom, this condition so fundamental to various intellectual and spiritual ends, in order to enjoy material or psychological advantages. Only certain elites have a real stake in the liberty of self-expression. Thus liberal revolutions come from above while their democratic counterparts come from below. To the former belong the risings and rebellions of 1215, 1222, Golden Bull, Arnie Bula, 1688, 1776, 1789, Lafayette, Noai, Mirabeau, 1825, Decabrists. Yet it must not be forgotten that liberal revolutions, by the very fact of being revolutions, suffer from the inner contradiction of having to use force, a principle opposed to liberty. Moreover, by breaking up familiar patterns they create uncertainties and fluctuations which cannot be easily controlled, and result in conditions which are the very opposite of the liberal blueprints. The devotees of Voltaire never suspected the rise of a Robespierre or a Napoleon, the Madrid professors who hailed the establishment of a republic in 1931 hardly envisaged the rise of a Negrin or a Franco, little did the Russian intelligentsia expect a Red October, and to the enthusiasts of the Weimar Republic it was by no means manifest that the fall of the Hohenzollerns rendered the rise of Hitler possible. Egalitarianism and liberty are sometimes seemingly compatible but, as we pointed out in the introduction, they are alternatives in their teleological aspects. A word of caution has to be said about the misuse of the term equality in connection with Christian doctrine. Christianity was by no means egalitarian, but merely established new values and new, physical as well as metaphysical, hierarchies. Human equality, theologically analyzed, is restricted to the equality of souls in the very beginning of their existence, but this equality is not continuous throughout a person's lifetime. Potentiality and actuality should not be confused. The spiritual equality of two newborn babes in the sight of God is merely a start. Judas Iscariot expiring in the noose and St. John the Evangelist closing his eyes on Patmos are spiritually not equals. If we focus our attention upon the biological, correct teriological, intellectual and physical status of the individual, the inequalities are even more apparent. Egalitarianism under the best circumstances becomes hypocrisy, if sincerely accepted and believed in, its menace is greater then all actual inequalities appear without exception to be unjust, immoral, and tolerable. Hatred, unhappiness, tension, a general maladjustment is the result. 
The situation is even worse when brutal efforts are made to establish equality through a process of artificial leveling, social engineering, which can only be done by force, restrictions, or terror, and the outcome is a complete loss of liberty. The egalitarian and anti-personalistic terror of the French Revolution was perhaps partly prepared by the views of Abbe Mobley, who traced the victory of Rome and the decline of Greece to the egalitarian statism of Rome and the individualistic disunity of the Hellenes. Even today our liberties are menaced by the same basic obsession. 2. Moral Aspects of Democracy Conceptually, as distinct from practically, the choice between quality and quantity, the best or the most, is crucial and will not admit of compromise. Rosalind Murray. One of our modern authors has made the remark that, from a Christian point of view, the efficiency of democracy remains a secondary question, any form of government has to be judged by the Christian primarily as to its ethical content. The validity of this statement cannot be doubted, and it is theoretically possible that the Christian here, as in other matters, is faced by a tragic dilemma between the good and the useful. Only a Benthamite would refuse to see a potential antithesis between these two notions. The days are also past when infinite wisdom has been attributed to collective judgments. But, on the other hand, the chorus of those defending democracy on ethical grounds has been considerably swelled in recent years, indeed, the ranks of the philosophic defenders of democracy have been strengthened by moral theologians, not only of the Protestant persuasion, but even of the Catholic Church. It has been argued again and again that self-government pertains to man's nature, and that democracy actually is self-government. In spite of St. Thomas' condemnation of democracy, we have seen Neo-Thomists trying to prove conclusively that democracy is not only a good form of government but even the only truly moral one. These thinkers often insist on debating their problem in vacuo. This is, of course, their right, provided they are able to withstand the temptation to introduce into their deliberations entirely fictitious elements. We believe that their concept of man is artificial, that their notions of the common good are out of focus, that their idea of society is a curious patchwork of opposites partly atomistic and partly totalitarian, and that their desire to make a popular idea plausible may have blurred their vision. Their mistakes are not only of a philosophical but also of a theological nature. There is a very strong flavor of Rousseau in their arguments. It must, in fact, be admitted that Catholic political theory in general looks, from a strict Lutheran point of view, rather optimistic and even Rousseauian. Before we deal with the problem of a pure democracy in a more immediate fashion, we have to make a digression into the field of original sin. The reader without religious conviction or theological training has no good reason to become weary of our investigation. As a matter of fact, whatever we have to say in this and the following paragraphs can be translated easily into secular terms. According to Catholic theology man, originally far more perfect than he is now, because of his fall was deprived of his extraordinary gifts and weakened in his nature, spoliatus gratuitus et vulnerus in naturalibus. This result is not a punishment in the narrow sense of the term, since we cannot maintain that Adam had any right to the privileges he enjoyed before the fall. To the first group of losses belongs, for instance, eternal life on earth. The agnostic will readily agree that we are mortal. He will also agree that he could imagine a state of human perfection which man does not possess, it is only too obvious that we are exposed to maladies, that we get tired, that we forget, that our senses fail us, that our whole moral fiber is shot through with weaknesses. The agnostic will certainly reject the Judeo-Christian explanation of our imperfections, but he can hardly overlook the reality which interests us here. Now first of all, let us ask the question whether there would be government at all in a humanity without original sin? St. Thomas Aquinas answers this problem in the affirmative. Man, according to St. Thomas, is not only a social animal but also intrinsically a political animal. Yet we, to our regret, are unable to agree with the angelic doctor. It is perhaps inadvisable to inject historical animadversions into a philosophic or theological argument, but we cannot help thinking of certain evolutions which have taken place in the last few centuries. It seems to us that the state is, in a sense, a concretization of society. While society has to act where individuals fail, the state has to discharge functions which unorganized society is unwilling or unable to perform. Society has also, by the way, suffered by original sin, In fact it might be argued, on the principle that corruption of the best is the worst corruption, that the perversion of society has resulted in evils more oppressive than the failings of the state, these limits between social and political functions were in the Middle Ages extremely unclear. The feudal system was of a social as well as of a political nature. Even monarchy, in our days rated as a survival, also has such a dual aspect. It is evident that modern government has achieved an autonomy from society, we mean autonomy, the power to make and live by its own laws, 
which would baffle and frighten the medieval observer. Nietzsche's coldest of all monsters would terrify pre-Renaissance man. State, the hard shell of society, can now be separated from the body social like the outer hull of a broiled lobster. And if we look now at the essential functions of the modern state, the waging of wars, sanitation, social legislation, regulation of education, inspection of factories and cemeteries, law courts, and so on, then we have to doubt strongly that the state is compatible with paradise. We have only to remind the reader of the thesis of José Ortega Agasset, who considers the automobile to be an expression of human, physical, mortality. If we were immortal we could as well walk from New York to Los Angeles. Hence the indifference towards the time element in originally strongly religious civilizations, the manana of the Spaniards and the Zoptra of the Russians, even if automobiles should be manufactured in an eternalized paradise, the reader is reminded that paradise has nothing to do with heaven, human beings would in all likelihood be perfect drivers, and thus not be in need of green lights and traffic policemen. And even if we are wrong in this, it still must be pointed out that man prior to original sin might have enjoyed head-on collisions, being immortal he could not possibly take serious harm. Moreover, without the original sin there would be no universities as we know them, no medicine, no theology, as we understand it, no law school, no polytechnic. It is obvious that this whole question is a very important one because it is not immaterial to know whether the state belongs to the calamities in the wake of original sin or not, whether it is in the same category as painful childbirth, disease, and stupidity. The secular version of this question is merely an inquiry as to whether the state is a result of the perfection or the imperfection of man. Luther, with his almost limitless pessimism as to the nature of man, went even a step further than we do, he agreed that the state results from the fall, yet he does not see in it a simple and logical effect of original sin but rather a specially ordained punishment. Protestant political theology in Germany has always been deeply affected by this view, which produced fatal consequences during the centuries following the Reformation. But let us return to the main theme. We know that democracy can be either direct or indirect. Direct democracy is feasible in small units, and it still survives in New England town meetings and in certain Swiss cantons. It is obvious that direct democracy, restricted by size, has a good chance to escape the character of a mass democracy which, in recent years, has been so severely criticized by Pope Pius XII. We should also remember that even Rousseau found democracy desirable only in small political units. Under such ideal conditions the element of anonymity and irresponsibility can be brought down considerably. Yet as a result of the many inventions of modern times direct democracy could today be realized in a large nation also. It would certainly be feasible to install black and white push buttons in every household, which could work by inserting a latch key. At noon the citizenry could be informed over the radio by a steering committee in the capital about the various political and legislative propositions. In the evening the vote could be taken and registered by electric adding machines in the center of the nation. At 10 p.m. the results could be announced. Thus a nation could declare a war on Monday, suffer a defeat on Tuesday, sue for an armistice on Thursday and reopen hostilities, if this were still possible, on a new motion on Saturday. We have not made this proposition as a joke, but as an illustration of what the democratic principle pure and simple would mean, the most far-reaching possible harmonization of the general will, i.e., the majority's will, with current policies, political practices, laws, and so forth. It is quite evident that this proposition is divorced from any practical value, but we have to ask ourselves whether a good, provided it really is a good, can become an evil if it exists in an unadulterated form. Moral philosophy and moral theology, unlike chemistry, admit of no alloys. To maintain that a thesis is true in the abstract and untrue in the concrete is pure Manichaeism or bombinatio in vacuo. Valid ethics have to be at least theoretically practicable. We will admit that it is perhaps possible that a direct democracy, carefully synchronized with all popular desires and whims, would be a sound proposition were it based on a population untainted by original sin. Would it, by the way, turn out to be a government by unanimity? This seems unlikely if we accept St. Thomas' theory that intellectual gradations would still exist in a population free of original sin, a humanity consisting of perfect persons, not omniscient, but with limitless and unerring intellectual capacities, endowed with firm, well-grounded characters and with clearness of vision, could be trusted with such an otherwise suicidal constitution. Everybody could become an expert in politics, as well as in other subjects, because the expert, in the narrow sense of the term, is precisely the result of our intellectual imperfection. Perfect man could gradually learn and understand everything, and perfect man has to concentrate on a few matters and listen to the advice of other experts within the society in which he lives. Of symbolic value are the efforts of Adam and Eve, after the fall, 
to clothe themselves in aprons of leaves, Genesis 3. 7. This clumsy effort was rectified by the Lord who made them clothes of skins, Genesis 3. 21. Particularly in medicine is the dependence of the layman on the expert noticeable. Society is thus an agglomeration of cripples who have to help each other, and, naturally, those who have a real grasp of politics and statecraft are few and far between. Yet it is precisely this overlooking of original sin with its moral and intellectual results that seduces the democratic ideologists of the neo-Thomist persuasion to arrive at their rigid and dogmatic constructions. They have, by necessity, the most daring educational schemes which take into account neither innate intellectual inequalities nor the absolute limitations of our capacities. The ethical dogmatists of democracy run into equally hopeless difficulties when they have to deal with the problem of territorial allegiances. According to their views the inhabitants of individual provinces, cities or villages should have the right to vote periodically on their status in relation to their state, whether they want to keep their ties, whether they want to join a neighboring state or whether they want total independence. An interesting dilemma thus arises when the majority of citizens of a nation disapprove of the results of local plebiscites, or when a local general will in a corner of a province opposes the pan-provincial general will. Whatever their answer, there will always be sheer arbitrariness in the delineation of territorial categories. There is, for instance, no doubt that the majority of the population of the British Isles would not, on a purely plebiscitarian basis, have given freedom to Ireland. There is equally no doubt that a majority of Irishmen would have voted for secession from the United Kingdom. It is also manifest that the majority of the population of the six northern counties of Ulster would oppose the Irish majority and insist on keeping their ties with Britain. Conversely it must be admitted that at least two counties, Fermanagh and Tyrone, would oppose the majority of Ulstermen and vote for union with ERA. The problem of boundaries and local allegiance would exist in a world state also. It is rather naive to believe that borders are felt merely on account of customs officials and passport regulations. No United States of Europe could have been erected over the monstrosities of the 1919 boundaries, disregarding this fact would mean merely to rename international wars internal conspiracies and revolutions. Already the idea has been sounded that a super Gallup poll would be a truer democracy than the present constitutional order, although the 1948 election may have weakened this idea somewhat. But many calling themselves Democrats would voice preference for a mixed form of government in which the democratic factor is counterbalanced by institutions and political organs which are not democratic in nature. The Senate of the United States, for instance, is from the point of view of the modality of its election a Republican rather than a Democratic institution, Nevada with 93,000 and New York with 11 million inhabitants elect each two senators. Whether the Senate is Democratic or Republican in its function depends on the relationship of the senators to their constituents and on their personal convictions. A Senate trying to repeat public opinion is, from a functional point of view, a Democratic body. Yet both, Republicanism and democracy, are intimately tied up with the history and the institution of parliamentarism, whose background and roots are in aristocratic or oligarchic soil. In some countries the personality of the parliamentarian overshadows his party allegiance, in others the deputy is only the delegate of the party, and the voter can merely choose between parties, not candidates. In the former case we have to distinguish between parliaments in which the party discipline is strict, for example, Britain, and those in which it is not, for example, the United States. These categories have, as we are going to see, their important moral aspects. 3. Difficulties and Illusions Man of the past does not resemble the man of today. He would have refused to form part and parcel of the animal herds which the plutocratic, Marxist or racist democracies keep for the factories and the charnel houses. George's Bernanos. Harold Lasky thought that a sound parliamentary democracy rests on two pillars, a, a common framework of reference, and, b, a two-party system. We agree wholeheartedly with him, but want to add that the former postulate is even more important than the latter. In the absence of a common political language and a basic common political philosophy a real parlement, a dialogue between the parties, and constructive discussions are impossible. Under these circumstances the parties cease to be mere ins and outs, and elections become minor social and political earthquakes. It must also be expected that in the case of fundamental differences the Constitution and, especially, the spirit of the Constitution, will receive support only from a few parties or, as has frequently happened, from no parties at all. It has then the character of a mere provisional arrangement. The existence of more than two parties, on the other hand, leads easily to minority rule. A small party which holds the key to the absolute parliamentary majority can quite effectively run the country, and thus the democratic principle of majority rule is eliminated. 
In Rump Austria between 1919 and 1933, for instance, none of the three parties really supported the constitution of the Democratic Republic. The Chrysler Sozial were Catholic crypto royalists, the Sozial Demokraten were Marxians with a totalitarian bent who, as pan Germans, together with the Grossdeutsch, denied not only the constitution but the very independence of the country. Yet the establishment and survival of both of Lasky's conditions fall into the domain of society, the free state can decree no common ideological denominator nor prevent the rise of additional parties. The totalitarian state, with its annexation of society, is in a very different position, and desires the number of parties reduced to a single one. In these societal aspects of the Lasky premises we get a hint as to the intrinsic connections between state and society. Moreover, they help us to realize that constitutions are mere frames, in which all sorts of pictures may be hung. An outsider, a European for instance, may conceivably argue that the United States has basically a one-party system. The elections merely determine the strength of the wings. And the vote often becomes, not an ideological manifestation, but simply a protest against persons in power. The situation in Britain used to be very similar. Part of the success of the democratic and parliamentary regime in the English-speaking countries has to be ascribed to the fact that the societies of these countries, and especially the society of the United States, which lacks the royal alloy, have tried wisely and jealously to preserve the common ideological denominator. In the United States practically 100% of the population believes in republicanism and democracy, and Professor R. H. Gabriel is right when he points out that democracy is part and parcel of American nationalism. Republicanism and democracy, with all their implications, are taught and extolled in schools and theaters, in daily papers and in periodicals, in commencement speeches and in films, in novels, textbooks and radio comments, in drugstore conversations, in sermons and at cocktail parties. At first this phenomenon, almost unique in modern history, seems paradoxical in a country made up largely of a variegated immigration, but we have to keep in mind that America is built on a voluntaristic basis. To be an American is frequently not an accident but a matter of choice and free decision. It means conscious assimilation and amalgamation. The word Americanism is not without real significance. And to the voluntaristic principle we have to add the simplicity of the historical background, in Europe almost every historical epoch leaves a distinct political heritage. And, last but not least, there is the geographic factor, two oceans gird the United States, and neither Canada nor Mexico are active exporters of political ideologies. The common possession with Great Britain of the English language is not conducive to ideological imports entirely alien to the American scene. And it is interesting to note that National Socialism, repeatedly insisting on its democratic character, envisaged in the far future the restitution of parliamentary democracy of a thoroughly American character. See Chapter 6. This is probably the deeper reason why the Reichstag was only packed, never abolished. According to one of our informants the plan existed to revitalize the Reichstag once a new, thoroughly Nazified generation had grown up. Then even a plurality of parties could be permitted, since all parties would automatically represent merely various shades of national socialism the Americanization of Germany then would be complete. The common framework of reference is, obviously, necessary not merely for fruitful parliamentary debate, but also for the very stability of the country in the course of elections. The two-party system alone would never do without the common denominator. In Britain, for instance, the common denominator is already of debatable validity. What happens if the Labour Party actually carries out a very far-reaching program of socialization, and is defeated at the next elections? Will the conservatives be able to sell state property to the highest, private, bidder? We must come to the conclusion that the actions of ruling political parties have a certain finality which creates historically irredeemable and irreparable situations. And we have to add that if the difference between the parties is considerable, every election means a bloodless revolution, thus the ship of state will soon be on the rocks. To the foregoing problem it should be added that a law issued by one legislature can be cancelled by the next one, voted into power in order to remove that unpopular piece of legislation. But if a hasty declaration of war is made and the fight is lost, the electorate can only watch the actions of the government in impotent rage. The illusion of self-government breaks down. And the wheel of history having been turned inexorably permits of no erasure of the events which have taken place. Even if the vast majority of the voters disapproves of the decision of the government, no subsequent defeat at the polls is going to bring back to life those who have fallen on the battlefields. Matters are made worse if the deputies have been elected on a peace platform. Yet as we have seen before, the preservation of the tenet unity in necessary things presupposes something like an ideologically totalitarian society which condemns dissent and persecutes the nonconformist.
Since the politicized individual, not to be mistaken for Aristotle's political animal, is a postulate of political democracy, and the preservation of well-functioning parliamentary democracy demands a politically alert and mobilized society, the first steps towards a totalitarianism are already taken. We have, furthermore, to bear in mind that a society consciously and collectively safeguarding a common political ideology is automatically pledged to common cultural values resulting in a rigorous homogeneity as to its way of life. This political-cultural interrelationship has been well expounded by de Tocqueville in his De la Démocratique en Amérique. The folly of those who would like to impose political forms on societies unwilling or ill-adapted, though frequently made receptive by propaganda or defeat, becomes apparent if we bear this difficulty well in mind. The establishment and or preservation of such conformity involves an extraordinary discipline and solidarity, which might rather adversely affect political, religious, racial or ethnic dissenters. Legislation is obviously helpless in the face of social disdain, pressure or persecution. Said Sholomash very correctly in his essay in The Valley of Death, a person's constitutional rights are secure only when his social standing in the community is secure. Since we have spoken about religious dissent, a warning should be sounded in relation to religion as a sufficient common denominator or framework of reference. Just because most religions have, in spite of their numerous ethical and political principles, no concrete uniform political ideology, they would be too wide as a common denominator. Let us imagine, for argument's sake, a country with two roughly equal Catholic parties, one Republican, the other Royalist. We leave it to the reader to visualize all the difficulties and problems of such a situation. We might, again, conceive of a country with four parties, one Royalist, Conservative and Catholic, another Royalist, Conservative and Protestant, a third Republican, Progressive and Catholic, a fourth Socialist, non-Marxist and non-sectarian. What would happen under such circumstances? In all likelihood the political alignment would cut across the lines of religious allegiance. The Bavarian wing of the centrist, Catholic, party of Germany broke off in 1919 because the Bavarian Catholic royalists did not see eye to eye with the Prussian Catholic collaborators of the Weimar Republic. From the foregoing it also becomes fairly evident that an analysis of democracy in action has to use two separate vantage points, one in the case of the existence of a common denominator, the other one in the case of its absence. The ethical problem of self-government, as a principle, postulate and possibility, will be dealt with later on. Here we merely want to point out that the political aspects of democracy on the European continent, with the exception of Switzerland, give us valuable negative insights into the character of parliamentary democracy. There the two Laskian premises are absent, and thus the various constitutions become mere armistice agreements. The famous bon mot that wars arc nothing but continuations of diplomacy by other means may for this case be adapted to read that revolutions and civil wars are merely the continuation of democratic party politics by other means. In this sense the two Austrian revolutions of February and July 1934 were nothing but the only honest and direct forms of the inter-party dialogue that had been going on since 1919, the agreement of parties on a given constitution only indicates the fact that none of them has an absolute majority, and that a final showdown resulting in a one-party dictatorship would be premature. The elections thus receive the character of public manifestations demonstrating numerical strength. It is significant that, with things standing thus, the plurality of parties becomes a temporary safeguard against one-party dictatorship. It is obvious that parties which cannot hope ever to get a majority incline towards revolutionary tactics. Yet if one party receives an overwhelming majority, the transition to dictatorship can be made through bloodless and constitutional means, this transition often does not even need the expediency of amendments. It must not be forgotten, for example, that even after 1933 Germany continued as a republic, and that the Weimar Constitution was never abolished, but only suspended in parts. On the other hand, the impossibility of forming a coalition backed by a majority of parties can also lead to a deadlock and thus to a dictatorship of a cabinet. The Nazis came to power by a combination of both situations rapidly following one another. Even in the United States, with its common denominator, the perpetuation in power of one single party does not favor the preservation of parliamentary democracy. If for any reason one party were re-elected with an overwhelming majority 12 consecutive times, most checks and balances, including the Supreme Court, would break down or become obsolete. The safeguards against tyranny of the fairest constitution are relative and not absolute. After the late Franklin D. Roosevelt's re-election in 1944 the present author saw this danger in the United States, and wrote on the subject in no uncertain terms. In the 1948 elections the United States made further progress on the road to the one-party state. In 1952 the Democratic Party will be able to look back on 20 years of governmental monopoly. 
there is the added danger that their continued defeats will lead to a real demoralization of the opposition. Yet, since a, far more reliable, estimate of the Gallup poll tells us that 42.5% of the American voters are permanent supporters of the Democratic, and only 34.5% diehard defenders of the Republican Party, the repeated victories of the Democrats are not in the least surprising. Still, the higher percentage of permanent Democratic voters is not based upon a miracle either, in spite of its southern bourbon wing, the Democratic Party caters in nationwide relations to the lower, and this means to the bigger, half of the social pyramid. The situation in Britain is very similar, and there is little doubt that the Conservative Party has only slight hope of getting back into power. This remark was written before the elections of February 23, 1950. Ed, from one point of view the situation in Britain is even more catastrophic, because the socialist ideal has by and large conquered the lower classes, and socialism is capable of far worse blunders than the ideology of a mere lower class party out only to soak the rich and not to kill the goose which lays the golden eggs. Socialism in Britain has, moreover, created something like an irredeemable situation, since the Tories, if ever victorious, would lack the courage to undo socialism and to auction off the socialized, nationalized, industries to the highest bidders. Thus British national socialism is here to stay, this is all the more likely as the Conservatives, in a frantic effort to gain lower class support, are prone to sell the soul of the party by repeating socialist slogans. American Republicanism, we must remember Mr. Wendell Wilkie's Me Too attitude in face of the New Deal, has gone a very similar way. As we can see, the warning words of America's founding fathers, who insisted that democracy ends in expropriation, i.e., socialism, have not been heeded. Nevertheless, the developments in America and Britain are perfectly normal, they are the logical results of the democratic process, and the author, who was one of the few European writers to predict Mr. Truman's re-election, claims no originality or inspiration for having done so. His article presaging the event was written upon General Eisenhower's refusal to run for president. Had he run I believed he would have won the elections, just like Hindenburg, who won against the trend of the time by netting the GI vote of Germany in 1925. Mr. Dewey, who is neither an American aristocrat nor a perfect symbol of the common man, could not swim against the current. The development in Canada has reached an even later stage. Mr. Mackenzie King was able to invest his successor, M. Louis Etienne Saint Laurent, with crown and scepter. And the hopes of the conservative opposition were swept away by the tidal wave of the biggest liberal victory in history in the 1949 elections. A monarchy might become inefficient, unjust or even absolutistic. But unlike democracy it cannot peacefully and legally evolve into its very contrary. It is thus all the more significant that representative government in Europe, outside of Switzerland, was successful only if the royal, non-democratic alloy was present, as in the case of Britain, the Netherlands, Belgium, Denmark, Sweden, Norway. Of stable republics of a non-totalitarian character there are only two or three left, if we place the United States, Switzerland and Finland in that category. In this connection it must again be recalled that constitutions in themselves are no guarantees whatsoever for a liberal democracy in the Anglo-Saxon sense. The Constitution of the United States has been successfully adopted by many a South and Central American dictatorship, the Republic of Santo Domingo even has a two-party system, but for some time the two of them had only one presidential candidate, dictator R. L. Trujillo, and the Constitution of the USSR theoretically acceptable by any Christian state, is in Russia the instrument of a totalitarian autocracy. Britain has no written constitution, but, paralleling Protestant bibliolatry, there is in some countries a real worship of written constitutions and politico-legal arrangements, just what was ridiculed by Plato, Republic, 8, 557. 4. Self-government. Every age is befooled by the notions which are in fashion in it. Our age is befooled by democracy. W. G. Sumner, quoted by Lloyd Morris. Postscript to Yesterday. The collectivistic character of a, politically, democratic society receives a certain psychological reinforcement from the essentially collectivistic structure of the political parties in a parliamentary framework. The political struggle may have for a few leaders, governors and rulers the aspects of I, thou and he, but for the masses the dialogue is based on we, you and they. The old egoism which so often characterized personal rule, monarchy, one-man dictatorship, and so on, flies out the window and is supplanted by a seemingly idealistic nostrism. This expression, in opposition to a brutal egoism and a Christian altruism, was first used by the Austrian National Socialist Walter Pembor. Nostrism is also highly characteristic of the European blood brother of democracy, ethnic nationalism. A man, 
personally to all outward appearances humble, modest and balanced, if infected by nationalism, may break into the wildest, most shameless and most irrational praise of his nation, of course tacitly including himself in the venerated collective. Nostrism is thus nothing but camouflaged egotism, yet on account of its collectivistic implications it is infinitely more devastating in its results. As a matter of fact, we have even come to respect the nostrist, a man who extols himself is easily a target for ridicule, but a man who sings the praise of his own nation is, after all, a good patriot who has our sympathies as long as his nation shows no hostility to ours. This disease has almost hopelessly poisoned the political atmosphere of the old world, and has an iron grip on the social layer considered to be the backbone of every progressive nation, the middle class. This situation is not exactly the same in the ideal parliamentary democracy as in the endangered one lacking the common denominator. An American, for instance, can say with a certain degree of truthfulness, we elect our president. This statement is correct if we assume that the defeated minority inwardly abides by the decision of the majority. The regulation determining that the majority should prevail over the minority may be entirely arbitrary and irrational, but since the constitution universally accepted in the country makes this stipulation, the rank and file of the minority can be said to have co-elected the president by merely participating in the process. This notion is, admittedly, in the spirit of Rousseau, cf. Contra Social, 4, 2. Of course, the few who for some reason are unable or unwilling to accept the constitution are out of luck. Since they will have to obey the victorious candidate of their political adversaries, they are not citizens in the sense in which Spinoza uses this term. In democratic European countries, where the constitutions are met with contempt since they are only arenas constructed for the occasion, or racetracks whose spectators expect a final winner terminating the race, the elections usually divide the voters into Spinoza's citizens on one side and into subjects, if not into slaves, on the other. There it can be truly said that not the nation but the majority elects its legislature and sometimes its chief executive. Yet the voter in the parliamentary democracy, no matter on which side of the Atlantic, is in his political capacity an individual and not a person. In total anonymity and secretiveness he votes as the smallest mathematically indivisible fraction of a nation. Neither should it be forgotten that this procedure represents the zenith of an invitation to irresponsibility, yet the impersonal nature of the voting process forces us to analyze the character of democratic self-government more critically. Fisher Ames, a century and a half ago, had no illusions about this claim of democratic apologists. Of course, if self-government is viewed from a national or collectivistic point of view, if a multitude is considered to be one organism with something like a responsible group soul, and if we simply identify the greater part with the whole, then the talk about self-government is justified. Yet such a point of view is only possible on a nostrist, and vostrist, basis, and political power from such a source comes curiously near to the anathematized statement in the syllabus, auctoritas nihil aliud es nisi numeri et materialium summa, authority is nothing else than numbers and the sum of material things. It is obvious that all these vistas are unacceptable to anybody clinging to a non-materialistic philosophy we have to reject them as figmentary and return consciously to the realities of the human person. It is, after all, man with all his glories and shortcomings, all his desires, longings, and emotions, his reason, his faith and his despair, who faces history and politics, and not some imaginary polycephalic centipede. To the philosopher of the new mechanism the difference between the effectiveness of one person's vote among five and among five hundred thousand will be merely in degree. This statement is mathematically correct but existentially this is by no means the case. Yet let us go a step further. If, for instance, the voters of France should be graphically represented by a solid column of the height of the Eiffel Tower, over 980 feet, one individual vote would measure not more than one three-thousandth part of an inch. In a modern mammoth state the individual at national elections is nothing more than a microbe, whether he in particular goes to the polls or not makes hardly any difference. His person and personality, as Aristotle stated melancholically, is counted and not weighed, and thus treated kappa alpha tau rho iota theta mu o grave nu lambda lambda mu kappa alpha tau xi alpha nu, by number but not by importance. Thus, nobody is indispensable is a highly democratic slogan. The conservative and personalist would say, everybody is unique. Everybody is indispensable. Nobody can be replaced. Even at the risk of being accused of delighting in exaggerations and hyperbolic statements, we insist that the aforementioned democratic slogan leads straight to the cremation stoves of Treblinka and Oshvenshim. Obviously, the noses counted in an election or the numbers figuring in the lists of selective service boards are interchangeable. So are the victims of a plebiscitarian tyranny. To these reflections it must be added that the intensity of a vote cannot be calculated either, 
If 51% of a nation vaguely approves of a party or of a particular measure the fanatical, fervent and desperate opposition of 49% is of no avail. There is no doubt that self-government is an enticing ideal and a fine dream. It may be part and parcel of our human nostalgia of the paradise lost, and related to the soothing vision of the anarchists. Actually it does not and cannot exist in its popular connotation. Human beings are algebraic entities who at the poles do not really add up. At the poles A plus B plus C is neither D nor 3, it is just what it says, A plus B plus C. The very choice of the candidates or the parties is limited and prefabricated, and thus the voter can often indulge merely in negations, voting against someone or something, and not in affirmations, unless he embraces a current political faith and closes his eyes to the personality of the candidate. An Austrian socialist, for instance, who had voted in 1920 for his Marxist party, found himself ruled by a clerical party under the leadership of a Monsignor, and thus exercise no self-government. And although the citizen in a parliamentary democracy based on Lasky's two pillars is psychologically in a better situation, much depends on his sportsmanship in the acceptance of the candidate of his luckier rivals, there are other aspects which make self-government largely illusory. Man, the tragic animal, is here again faced with defeat. Government is almost always unsatisfactory and disappointing. True self-government can only be the mastery man exercises over himself, most human beings need for this purpose a personal sphere, elbow room, privacy which cannot be invaded by either state or society. Families, for instance, are minor kingdoms, ideal spheres for the development of personality, and free societies always have strongly developed hierarchically built family cells. The franchise, as F. Lieber pointed out over two generations ago, is no synonym for liberty, it can therefore not guarantee this Lebensraum, this personal sphere, which is a postulate of liberalism and not of democracy. A Tyrolean peasant under Maria Theresa had, no doubt, a bigger and better guaranteed private sphere than, let us say, the average dweller in a New York Lower East Side tenement, not to speak of Berliners and Muscovites under their respective totalitarian regime. The concept of government by consent of the governed is practically identical with that of self-government, personally and existentially it is an accidental concomitant of any form of government including tyranny. To Comrade Ivanov, who is a convinced communist, the regime of the USSR is a government by consent of the governed as far as he is concerned. To citizen Petrov, relegated to the minus six, it is a tyranny. Moreover, the very reason for the difference in the two attitudes may be traced back to the psychological aspects of the government's propaganda effort. Comrade Ivanov is of the communist persuasion, citizen Petrov is still unconvinced. The ethical value of these political opinions and persuasions is another matter. To what extent do they genuinely form parts of the personalities of voters? It is certain that democracy rests squarely on the vacillations and shifting loyalties of a certain sector of the electorate, since well-grounded and unchanging political convictions would result in a freezing process which is the very end of democracy. Luckily there is in most democratic movements a more or less avowed tendency to disestablish, destroy, expropriate, some existing elite or aristocracy, and thus to effect a change, envy is usually the driving motor in these efforts. At the same time a new clique tries to get into power behind this smokescreen. This brings us to the thesis that parliamentary democratic government is always strictly oligarchical in character. This thesis was advanced over a century ago by Fisher Ames and then by Proudhon. In our days it was reaffirmed by H. G. Wells and received a more thorough treatment by Pareto, Mosca, and Robert Michels. The last mentioned expounded this thesis for the first time in his treatise on the sociology of political parties, and returned to it in a smaller work entirely dedicated to this issue. James Burnham in his The Machiavellians wrote a commentary on the oligarchic theory of democracy. Sir Henry Maine, however, doubted the creation of oligarchies or elites on a democratic basis, all he expected from the democratic process was a new despotism. In any case, if democracy is actually in practice nothing but a conspiracy of small, entrenched groups cleverly manipulating votes, the harsh judgment of René Schwab on democracy is indeed not far off the mark. Thus the final moral aspects of democracy in action with their final psychological implications, so constantly overlooked by the apologists of the democratic dogma, gain new and more depressing perspectives. To all this must be added a biological tendency towards oligarchy from intermarriage, family alliances and the heredity of natural gifts, which probably even democracy cannot counteract successfully. Especially if we believe in the analysis of Professor A. H. Lloyd, we are bound to see the specter of an enslavement to oligarchy menacing free democracies even from these quarters. 5. Ethics and representation. Flatter lay vices du pupla est encore plus lachette plus sale que de flatter lay vices des grands. Charles Peggy, Memoir et Dossiers.
ex senatus consultus at plebiscitus cellera exercenture. Seneca. When we survey the democratic scene one characteristic almost immediately captures our attention, lack of responsibility. It is interesting to note that irresponsibility was the standard charge against the monarchs, who were considered to be responsible to God only. Yet the advent of democracy has hardly increased the sense of responsibility, since democratic composite government has resulted in a division of responsibility which makes it ubiquitous and at the same time, through a process of atomization illusory. The electors who have dropped their ballots in unmarked envelopes can deny their misdeeds with a straight face, and the deputies who after an initial failure were not re-elected can claim that the time of their tenure was too short to permit the completion of their plans. There is also a widespread tendency to restrict the tenure of chief executives, power corrupts. As a result the amateur incumbents of this high office not only are prevented from utilizing their meager experience acquired at great cost, but the bar against their re-election or reappointment often puts them into a mood of frivolous indifference. And since the judges and censors of the politicians' actions are, seemingly, not God but the lay electorate, whose opinion has great practical but little ethical, historical or factual value, the sense of true responsibility will be blunted. Maintaining one's popularity with King Demos has nothing whatsoever to do with a sense of true responsibility which, in its finality, is always directed towards God. As, moreover, political power in a democracy is not inheritable except in a very oblique way, the judgment of history has hardly to be feared, as in the case of a dynasty. The follies of a Woodrow Wilson, a Clemenceau, a Lloyd George, or a Sonino had no direct ill effects on immediate members of their families. Most politicians are dead or in retirement when the results of their policies become manifest. But a Louis XVI, a Charles I of Austria, a Nicholas II had to pay for the errors or neglects of their ancestors. Still, the ethical problem of a democracy in action is greatest in the moral position of the politician. What is the duty of the successful political candidate? To speak and vote according to his own lights, or to become the mouthpiece of his constituency, thus merely voicing public opinion? Republicanism will favor the former theory, democracy the latter. The republican aspect of popular representation is one of a transfer of popular sovereignty to electees, while the democratic deputy is the representative of the voice of the people. The problem of the border lines between these two norms is one of the first magnitude, especially in the United States. It is evident that the dishonest Republican electee might sidetrack his own opinion to gain popularity, while a Democrat might be unable to resist the voice of his conscience. Yet, viewing this overlapping of theory and practice, the person adhering to Christian ethics can only approve of the Republican, not of the Democratic, thesis. To him human action is permissible only in conformity with one's conscience, see note 688. The true Christian as a candidate in a thoroughly Democratic state is almost unthinkable only in rare cases will he succeed in maintaining his position. Without a truly magic personality he can hardly expect success. Of course, there is the possibility of a deformed conscience prompting the deputy to act according to popular opinion and not according to his own conviction, thus making a sacrificium intellectus. The election year scare and the right to your senator. Proposition are largely democratic phenomena, unless the latter is done in a spirit of enlightenment, and not of pressure menacing the deputy with the sanctions of the ballot box. Several constitutions insist on the independence of the deputy from popular demands, but we cannot help doubting whether in spite of these written injunctions the Damocles sort of pending elections remains ineffective. It must be admitted, though, that in countries with election lists on a nationwide party basis, list and wall wrecked, the danger in this depersonalized system comes rather from the pressure of party discipline than from the retaliations of an irate electorate. In order to illustrate our ethical dilemma, let us imagine three candidates, a good Christian, a good pagan, and a bad pagan, running for office and holding an election meeting. They are heckled by the audience, and reply according to their lights. In order to illustrate our thesis we shall be rather typical and exaggerate their respective positions. 1. Question, we all want the Caloosahatchee Canal. Are you going to vote for it? 1. Question, we all want the Caloosahatchee Canal. Are you going to vote for it? The good Christian. I am sorry but I am going to vote against the project. I know that you would benefit from it locally but your local benefit is out of all proportion to the expenses which would have to be borne by the taxpayers of the whole nation. The good pagan. Though the prospects are not very bright I will do my best. As a representative of this area I will put its interests always first. The bad pagan. The canal has always been on the top of my agenda. Sure, I'll vote for it. This state is going to have the finest, broadest, blue stand smoothest canal in the world. 2. Question. What are you going to do about our relations with Mexico? 
We don't trust her. The good Christian. I have studied the problem of our relations with Mexico for many years. To give you an exhaustive and honest answer I would need at least three hours and I am not sure that you would even then understand what I mean. The good pagan. It all depends on what the present Mexican government is going to do about our investments. It is probably premature to make plans at the present moment. The interests of our nation are, naturally, paramount to me. The bad pagan. Nobody in his senses ever trusts Mexico. We won't play sucker to her again and the big stick remains the best policy. We're going to break off diplomatic relations with her, that's what I am going to vote for. 3. Question, we want better roads. We're against railroad subsidies. How are you going to vote in these matters? The good Christian. I have no idea. As a matter of fact I have never studied this problem and I know nothing about it. I will, though, investigate the matter, which might take me a couple of months. I've been told that it is a complicated question. The good pagan. Of course, better roads are necessary and I will vote for them. Like you, I view the railroad subsidies with mistrust. Yet I doubt that these matters will come up in the next session. Still, you can count on me. The bad pagan. That highway versus railroad problem is very simple. Only a stuffed shirt or long-haired professor would make it appear complicated. I'll give you the lowdown in a nutshell. It boils down to the following simple facts. Follows a three-minute outline. This sketch could be continued ad nauseum. The Christian candidate would be sincere, frank, serious. He would confess ignorance where need be, he would oppose his constituents when his conscience advocated disagreement, he would refuse to distort facts by popularizing them or by boiling them down to a deceptive simplicity, thus flattering the intellectual vanity of the credulous masses. The bad pagan simply lies to his voters, as Pascal put it, one must have a mental reservation, and judge everything by that, while nevertheless speaking like the people. He pretends to understand problems he is not acquainted with, and simulates knowledge, he is determined not to stick to his promises or even to act against his conscience. The good pagan is in the worst situation of all, he lies, quite subconsciously, to himself. He believes, perhaps in all sincerity, that one can square the circle, that one's own conscience, absolute truth, the feasible and permissible, the ethical and practical, public opinion and the useful, can all be brought under the same denominator. The tragedy of Christian existence is not for him, he would flee what Jean Wall calls decision Kierkegaardian. The calamities brought upon mankind by the fall have for him no reality. And in the overall scene, in the struggle between the three above-mentioned types, a fatal Gresham's law is operating, the inferior human currency drives the better one out of circulation. As Burkhardt said, itself a product of envy and mediocre men, it, democracy, can use only mediocre men for its tools. The good Christian's position is an almost hopeless one, since he is not willing to sacrifice ethical values to the Moloch of popularity. From the foregoing the inner weakness of the republican form of government is quite evident. St. Thomas rightly considers democracy to be the perversion of polity, republic, and it is obvious that the difference between these two is conceptual rather than constitutional. The same is true of the relationship between monarchy and tyranny, aristocracy and oligarchy. Although the three bad forms of government can be established as such, the perversion of the good forms of government lies, not in a visible change of their structure, but in a perversion, a turning awry of their aim and purpose. Constitutionally very little can be done to prevent the degeneration of a republic into a democracy, because the ulterior motives and aims of a person can rarely be judged by the outsider, just as, conversely, the monarch can appear to be, or actually change into, a tyrant, or the aristocrat into an oligarch. The decision of a ruler can seem to be purely in his own interest, whereas it will actually work for the common good, and the reverse is also true. Sometimes not even history can tell us the truth. One factor, and a very important one, in the preservation of a republic lies in the moral standards upon which a society is insisting. Another one is the limited material and honorific rewards a political career should offer, thus providing the Democrat with no economic, or other, advantages in, and incentives for, re-election. To the professional politician popularity, as a means to re-election, is the immediate goal. The Republican, on the other hand, should view popularity with indifference and failure in the elections with equanimity. This again is more likely if he has private interests, wealth and, perhaps, a career outside the political sphere. Hence the old Republican, but highly undemocratic, property qualifications, and herein lies the very tragedy of Republican government, which has to steer constantly between the scylla of a camouflaged aristocratic rule and then the charybdis of a democracy, the extremes of the Venetian Christianissima Respublica and Hitler's Republikanischer Vorstadt with a Deutsche Demokratie.
6. Knowledge. La colère des imbeciles ravage aujourd'hui la terre. Georges Bernanos, La France contre les robots. Having dealt with the ethical problem of the elector and elected, we have to investigate the intellectual aspects of democracy. Thus we come, first of all, to the problem of knowledge. Knowledge, in a narrower sense, is cognition of the true. An objective judgment can be made only if we know the nature of the object in question. Without a real knowledge of the object we cannot let reason make a judgment. On the other hand, a few external aspects, if perceived, are sufficient to let our emotions react. But while knowledge can discriminate between true and untrue, good and bad, the emotions can only express subjective feelings, likes and dislikes. In this case there is no comprehension but merely the recognition that something appears likable or unlikable to an observer. Without a grasp of the real nature of a thing only appearances can be dealt with. The picture of the object in the mind of the judging person becomes all important, the picture and not the reality. Thus I like you, thus I dislike you, says the person. It is obvious that real knowledge will, finally, correct that picture and basically alter the effective attitude of the observer. And under knowledge we might also distinguish between Vernunft and Verstand, reason and understanding. It ought to be conceded that there is a deeper understanding, and even knowledge, possible through affection and love. Yet love might not only open eyes but also make blind. The tenet I believe that I may understand, and I love that I may understand, may entail rich rewards but also terrible losses. Here lies the risk of a pure Augustinianism, as well as of a naked existentialism. There still remains the question whether we can remain absolutely neutral towards a phenomenon. Knowledge, intuition and emotion in relation to an object under scrutiny can be contemporaneous, but can we, especially towards objects which have a direct bearing on us, remain indifferent? In the absence of knowledge are we necessarily emotional? We are inclined to believe that this is the case. Hence Jacob Burkhardt's criticism of the anti-rational character of democracy. We do not have democracy in order to heed reason. If we had wanted that we could have kept limited franchise and respect for persons worthy of respect. If we compare now, for instance, one of the Swiss cantonal diets in the Middle Ages, or a New England town hall meeting, with the elective processes in a modern mammoth democracy, we will quickly discover that there is in the two first mentioned cases the possibility of an equitable relationship between political decision and personal knowledge. Even today the problems which crop up in the Diet of Glarus can be grasped by the voting citizenry. Yet in a large nation, what is the actual relationship between the world problems of today and the popular representatives, not to mention the vast voting masses? The grave problems moving the world demand at least a superficial comprehension of history, geography, economics, physics, international and constitutional law, foreign languages, military and naval science, agriculture, biology, racial psychology, diplomatic usage, and many more subjects besides. This need is somewhat subconsciously felt by the advocates of democracy, who therefore indulge in grandiose schemes of mass education, which still fall completely short of the necessary but unattainable goal. President Garfield, in reply to Macaulay's criticism, said, we confront the dangers of suffrage by the blessings of universal education. Yet we see how the knowledge of the voters as well as of their representatives remains insufficient to be used in an evaluation of the momentous problems of the world. Even John Stuart Mill had his doubts about the egalitarian character of democratic suffrage. As a result of all this, emotions increasingly dominate the political scene, and the shrinkage of one world, on the other hand, rapidly multiplies the number of questions having a bearing on individual nations. Owing to the perversity of this situation we have a never-ending series of failures, the reaction to which is often a cry for an unlimited rule of experts. These are asked to rule with an iron fist, and to enforce a pagan utilitarianism of the worst Benthamite stamp. Ethics and human freedom would then be dispensed with as needless impediments. To these considerations the supporters of the democratic dogma will reply that the whole problem is not one of knowledge and efficiency, that the issue is purely moral, and concerned with such aims as self-government, freedom, and volition. They will quote freedom of choice in cases of doubt and the disciples of the liberal heresy will point out that we have a right to be wrong. It is, admittedly, sometimes prudent not to enforce truth, but a right to be wrong does not exist. In this connection we have to remember that government is not a final end. It is probably only a means to an intermediary end. And if good government is an art in the service of the common good, it is natural that those who have a higher skill in this art should, within proper limits, have a greater chance to serve the common good. It is perfectly true that a layman might make a better diagnosis of an illness than a doctor, or that a lawyer with artistic inclinations might design a better and more beautiful evening dress than a tailor. But there is also such a thing as prudence based on probabilities. The knowledge, 
skill and experience of physicians are directed towards diseases, those of tailors towards dressmaking. We also doubt that every man is a political animal in the narrow sense of the term. It seems obvious that the political power of a person, like any other accorded power, should be commensurate with the object, regardless whether the object is a proposition faced by a legislator or the choice between candidates belonging to parties confronted by major decisions. In the latter case the hapless voter is also called upon to exercise his psychological skill in relation to persons he hardly knows. In this quandary it does not matter whether the voter is one out often or one out of a million. It has been well said that 10 million ignorances do not make one piece of knowledge. As to the problem of control by experts, we want to repeat that the most pressing problem of good, and that automatically implies ethical, government lies today in building up defense machineries around spheres in which the person should have power and self-government approximately commensurate with his own capacities. The Middle Ages and their aftermath were characterized by a multitude of such autonomous and semi-autonomous spheres, medieval man frequently belonged to a variety of these. Moral perfection and intellectualization for central governments, coupled with a restriction of their radius of action, should be our program, the very reverse of the existing trends. The characteristics of modern mass government are, a central organ increasing in totality and ubiquity, driven by emotions but employing bureaucratic staffs of varying qualifications and efficiency, and putting, more or less, knowledge and experience to the service of whims and emotions, thus placing the heart above the brain. Totalitarian dictatorships, though hampered by irrational doctrines, nevertheless rely more on the help of experts, and they are, in addition, highly conscious of the fact that emotions can be manufactured. The question of expert knowledge versus amateurism is all the more pressing because, if there ever was an equitable relationship between the voting masses and the issues confronting them, it is now rapidly waning. We have already hinted at the multiplication of problems in a shrinking world, this situation is aggravated by our steadily decreasing relative, personal knowledge. While the actual knowledge of mankind, stored in millions of books, files, and specialized brains, continues to rise at a mad pace, the knowledge necessary for the understanding of world affairs advances in a geometric progression, standard individual knowledge, if at all, only in an arithmetic one. Is it not more than certain that the burning problems of our age and time, atomic fission, European politics, the economic cycles, Far Eastern affairs, to name only a few, are properly understood by only a microscopic minority in every modern nation? By one in a thousand? Or is it one in ten thousand? But man will always judge, object, criticize, praise, condemn, regardless of his qualifications. He has a good right to do that. Still, the question remains whether his emotional reaction should affect the common good. It is fairly obvious that the enormous disorder and chaos in this world is not the result alone of the flagrant breach of practically every ethical postulate, but is also due to the retreat of knowledge and reason from the domain of politics. Oksen Werner's injunction was never truer than today. It really seems that statesmanship is incompatible with politics in the democratic sense. We have seen great statesmen, of the ethical as well as of the Machiavellian pattern, in monarchies, aristocratic republics and post-revolutionary tyrannies. Yet the complete lack of security of tenure, necessitating a constant preoccupation with mere politics, is a fatal handicap in democracies. It is to be doubted that the parliaments of the last 50 years have produced a single outstanding statesman. Products of the old British oligarchy like Disraeli or Gladstone would be unthinkable in the democratized parliamentary scene of today. The fact remains that in all democratic nations the person of the politician is treated with contempt, and politics are looked upon by a healthy public opinion as a cocktail of deceit, lying, treachery, double-dealing, graft, theft, insincerity, perjury, imposture, dishonorable compromise, and other vices. There is, however, a time lag between the disappearance of the general respect given to the human organs of the Constitution and that given to the Constitution itself. In countries where the Constitution is not a mere armistitial arrangement but the survival of a grand, but defunct, republican order, we often find a very considerable difference between the homage paid to the constitutional order and the enthusiasm accorded to the deputies and other elected representatives of the nation. Of this discrepancy the citizens are sometimes not only conscious, but even proud. To the historian this antithesis is neither new nor particularly encouraging. After 200 years of cheerful and ironic anti-clericalism the Reformation came after all, and destroyed the fabric of the Church in a number of nations. The scholastic I distinguish has little bearing on the masses. In order to complete our line of argumentation we have to mention the possibility of an artistic, aesthetic, way of governing a nation, a pattern not based on pure emotions nor on reason and knowledge. The probability and possibility of such an art of government is limited, 
although not to such an extent as generally surmised. In nations with a strong sense for aesthetic values the artistic element in the political leadership is of considerable importance, since it appeals to the dark borderlines of reason, emotion and Pascal's raison du cœur que la raison ni connaît pas, reasons of the heart which reason does not know. The emotional, egoistic and irrational demands and vagaries of the masses, reflected in their representatives, leads finally to considerable tensions between the parliaments and the administrations. This is especially true in the secretive war and foreign offices, which by their very nature can never become fully democratized. The dilemma between the demand for intellectual qualifications, labeled as undemocratic, and the grave crises due to the usual democratic amateurism is insoluble. Neither can countries lacking expanding economies and natural defenses afford the costly method of trial and error. This was felt by Metternich as early as the second quarter of the last century. He said to Tickner, I labor chiefly, almost entirely, to prevent troubles, to prevent evil. In a democracy you cannot do this. There you must begin by the evil, and endure it, till it has been felt and acknowledged, and then, perhaps, you can apply the remedy. In the meantime we can observe how the tension between parliamentarians and bureaucrats rises in all those nations where the number of political appointees in the administration is limited and the standards of the civil services are high. The total elimination of the parliamentary machinery then becomes the dream of the bureaucrats, and the probability of a dictatorship promising greater efficiency increases. In this case the rebellion of the experts against lay control takes a particularly violent form. Entirely insoluble is the problem a democracy faces in a total war, not only during such a war, but even before the first shot is fired. Since democracy is ruled by the people and no entire nation ever wishes a war, a tyrannical government, which can choose the exact moment of attack, has a simply tremendous advantage. 7. Shadows of Tyranny Compressing the idea into one syllable, Hamilton at a New York dinner replied to some democratic sentiment by striking his hand sharply on the table and saying, your people, sir, your people is a great beast. Henry Adams The antinomy between the bitter reality of politics and the constitutional tradition are not the only factors in creating a certain cynicism and a general poisoning of the atmosphere in a democracy. Even more dangerous is the enforcement of the common framework of reference the block ideas incontestables, the fund of indisputable ideas as Laval's calls it. This particular task of a democratic society is not only not without spiritual perils, but it produces also a uniformity which can have adverse effects on the intellectual scene. The result is a lack of distance between the person and society, which in this case is strongly annexationist. A secret police is conspicuously absent, but there are ostracism and boycott, the typical forms of persecution sanctioned by democratic society and directed against the nonconformist. Consider the numerous colloquial, slang, expressions denoting a nonconformist prevalent in democratic civilizations, outsider is still literary, but we have also such terms as stuck-up, stuffed shirt, highbrow, crackpot, hi-hat, and so on, as opposed to ordinary, decent chap, regular fellow, regular guy, square shooter, fellow like you and me, etc. The real ruler becomes everybody, they say so, John Q., public, Mr. Average Man. There is something essentially inhuman and even unchristian in the masses and in the this-worldly aspects of society, which we do not necessarily find in the individual. Especially if a society harbors paganizing tendencies and strays collectively from the path of truth and virtue, the vigilance of the person easily becomes paralyzed. Christopher Dawson writes, It is the very function of the Christian to be moving against the world, and to be protesting against the majority of voices. And though a doctrine such as this may be perverted into a contempt of authority, a neglect of the church and an arrogant reliance of self, yet there is a sense in which it is true, as every part of Scripture teaches. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, is its uniform injunction. Everywhere we can hear the exclamation, there's nothing wrong about it, everybody does it. And since the omnipotent society rules through the public praise of labels and shibboleths, we see as a result all heresies, mischievous actions, immoral propositions making their conquests under an elaborate camouflage in order not to challenge openly the powerful forces of the social behemoth which can be far more potent than the state leviathan. Thus we see communism in the democratic orbit proclaiming itself, not as messianic atheist proletarianism, but as streamlined democracy or as 20th century Americanism and, and Huey Long very penetratingly said that when fascism came to the United States it would call itself democracy. The lack of frankness and courage, as well as the powerful sway of collective myths, drains the essence from most notions. In the basically non-democratic world with free societies and democratic constitutions, the situation is quite different. There the principles of indirect democracy, equality, election of representatives and majority rule, appear as a mere constitutional frame, 
any conceivable picture can be fitted into it. Hence the absolute futility of enforcing democracy. The frame might be imposed, the picture never. Constitutions may be decreed, but societies are entities of natural growth, unless we do some social engineering. Since these societies are divided into deeply antagonistic groups of an ideological pattern, none having so far an absolute majority, no real picture but at best a mosaic can be offered. Yet all parties will strive to reach an absolute majority in order to rule without being hampered and handicapped by partners in a coalition. We have likened the parliaments with their elections to racecourses in which finally, after many indecisive rounds, a real winner will appear. But the achievement of a real majority by one single party usually signals the very end of the constitutional process, in all likelihood a determined effort will be made to freeze this happy situation, and to cancel the struggle for supremacy once and for all by constitutional amendments. Thus J. C. Blunchley was right in pointing out two dangers of democratic republics, a. demagogy and demagogues, b. parties who are not curbed by any superior power. Hence the greater stability of parliamentary instability in monarchies. When the Nazis and their nationalists tail 151.4% of all seats in the Reichstag, the democratic process of the Weimar state had come to an end, and the Führer's incarnation of the masses took over the reins of the Republic. For a more complete analysis of the German constitutional tragedy, see below, pages 261-263. Of course, there are shortcuts to modern tyranny by revolutions and pronunciamentos, Russia, Italy. Yet it must be borne in mind that all modern tyrannies were, and are, party dictatorships with a parliamentary prehistory. And full party dictatorship is possible only in a republic, or in a monarchy camouflaged as such. A leader, Führer, Duce, Vosht, is not a ruler. He marches ahead but is, theoretically at least, an equal. As a modernized tribune of the people he is not only the product of political but also of social democracy. Thus in Italy the rupture between the dictatorship of the fascist party and the monarchy had to come sooner or later, when Mussolini established his Repubblica Sociale Italiana and thus reverted to his earlier republican program. No wonder that it is the republic which has become synonymous with dictatorship, not the monarchy. Of liberal, democratic republics there are only three surviving, the United States, Switzerland and, perhaps, Finland, to which one might add the Irish experiment. All other republics are either ruled dictatorially or stand on the brink of civil wars. True democracy, in the popular sense, is much more at home in the monarchies of northwestern Europe and the British Commonwealth. And it is significant that all these nations, whether monarchical or republican, are, with the exception of Belgium, predominantly Protestant or have a superimposed Protestant culture. Thus the value of the monarchical alloy should not be underestimated. If society has failed to establish a common denominator for all political parties, a mere alloy, as the case of Italy in 1922 has demonstrated, is not sufficient, and a more effective strengthening of the monarchical factor becomes necessary. We have to ask ourselves whether in the most extreme cases, when violent temperament is combined with thorough ideological incompatibility, Spain, Portugal, Greece, South America, government from above on a bureaucratic basis is not the only safeguard against the alternative of anarchy and party dictatorship, which again reminds us of Plato's warning, tyranny, then, arises from no other form of government than democracy. Among these nations the political ideologies are dynamite, a fatally disruptive force, to introduce such a highly explosive element into the legislative body is sheer folly. It makes sense to let a couple of calm, well-bred, gentle Catholic theologians debate the problems of grace and free will. Such an interchange of ideas stands a good chance of being constructive and methodical. Yet a discussion between a member of the Federation Anarquista Iberica, and a Navarrese Carlist on the curriculum of state secondary schools has no theoretical or practical value whatsoever. The final argument in such a discussion can only be civil war and the dialogue of machine guns. The attempt to stage discussions between people of widely divergent views is in itself quite harmless. A free society whose task is not to preserve the premises of a sound parliamentary democracy will always tolerate dissent. The suicide and downfall begins if dissent is made the essence of government. Nobody in his senses would elect a king suffering from schizophrenia to rule a country. As a matter of fact, a hereditary king suffering from schizophrenia, unlike a parliament divided against itself, would be automatically replaced by a regency. In contemplating this whole situation we must never forget that by far the greater part of Western civilization is either Catholic or Greek Orthodox. The Protestants on the European continent form only 13%, of the population. Thus the relativism of the Protestant liberal world is only a parochial phenomenon. The non-Protestant world would insist that if A is correct and B differs from A, then B must be wrong. 
hence also the conspicuous absence of convinced Democrats among continental European thinkers of the first order. It would be very difficult to name more than a dozen of them, and our efforts to find more than two have failed. We are speaking of thinkers, not of literati who not only crave a public as chaplains of King Demos, but are also attracted by the sentimental and artistic qualities of democracy, which so easily assumes the character of a secularized religion. Yet this relativism, which the clear thinker and logician rejects, plays an enormous role in the political and spiritual realm of democracy. We leave it to the psychologist to determine the feminine implications of such relativism. But relativism and readiness for compromise go hand in hand, and an absolute refusal to compromise on fundamentals, a Catholic rather than a Protestant trait, would soon bring democratic machinery to a standstill. The political coalitions of the temporary democracies and the Catholic orbit have contributed more than anything else to the undermining of the moral prestige of politicians, yet the various coalition governments with their combinazioni are not the only manifestations of compromise, the voter has, first of all, to make a compromise between his own views and those of the party he supports. The electee will have to compromise in a similar way. In the democracy with several parties the parties will have to compromise among themselves. They collectively will have to compromise with reality, i.e., the facts, and also with the oscillations of public opinion. This frenzy of compromise differs curiously from the noble device, Prius mori quam fidari, sooner die than compromise. And it is the most destructive moral and psychological preparation of the masses for facing oppression and enslavement. It is significant that the most heroic resistance against the Nazi invaders came from backward nations which had a minimum of democratic experience. The resistance of the French, Belgians, Dutch and Danes cannot in the least be compared with that of the Poles, Serbs, Greeks or even the Italians. The heroic struggle of Warsaw is without parallel in the history of the 20th century. And so is its betrayal. It is not surprising that the liberal heresy is a much better foundation or lubricant for the smooth functioning of a democratic republic than a theology or philosophy insisting on absolutes. In the religious field the liberal heresy, in turn, harmonizes best with modern, liberal Protestantism. Once we reject either the existence of absolute truth or its human attainability, and this is the essence, not of liberalism but of the liberal heresy there can be no virtue attached to a stubborn defense of convictions of verities. We have only to remember the tragedy of the liberal heretic in the person of Pilate. In John 18. 37-38 we read how our Lord insists in His presence that He is indeed a King who came into this world in order to be a witness for truth. Everyone born of truth will listen to His voice. And Pilate asks, what is truth? He is convinced that he can get no answer to this question, he leaves the Son of Man, walks out to the howling mob and shifts in his predicament from liberal doubt to democratic procedure. The majority shall decide. 8. Additional Aspects of the Problem In certain historical periods one has to make the full circle of follies in order to return to reason. Benjamin Constant Returning to the basic issue of democracy, we have again to ask ourselves whether indirect democracy is still full democracy. Just as no constitutional injunction can prevent a republic from becoming, partly or wholly, a democracy, this process can also happen in reverse. Such a development is, though, less likely, because the wages for the capital sin of disregarding public opinion are removal by the ballot. But even if we take the sanctions of the masses into consideration, the fact remains that actual power, albeit for a limited time, is invested in a few. Viewed from this angle, a republic or a democracy are oligarchical monarchies with a time limit. Under these circumstances the differences between oligarchy and democracy, between aristocracy and republic, are gradual rather than fundamental. Direct democracy, as we have seen, is not feasible on any larger scale. The practicality of democracy begins only when we inject the aristocratic, parliamentary, or monarchical, presidential, alloy. Yet the alloy is perfectly workable by itself, as we know by historical experience. The ethical defender of the democratic dogma is thus in the curious position of having to admit either a total independence of reality from philosophy, or to project his calculations and visions into a hypothetical millennium of a super-race. Thus we seem to be confronted by the question whether government as such is not in its very essence an activity emanating from one or only a few. Whatever the answer, it remains fairly certain that the number of ultimate governors dwindles with the size of the country and its population. This paradox is no less evident in Russia than in China, the Spanish Empire and the United States, whose monarchical organ, the President, enjoys surprisingly great powers. The classic republics of an oligarchic aristocratic pattern, Venice, Genoa, the Hanseatic cities, never surpassed medium size. The democracies were even smaller.
the enormous expansion of the Roman Republic prior to and under Caesar and Augustus hastened its transition from democracy to the dictatorship of the Caesarian Principate. Today the old evolution from tyranny or dictatorship to legitimate monarchy is, for historical reasons, less likely. Polybius' turn of the wheel, nu alpha kappa kappa lambda omega sigma iota sigma, is in an impasse. The evolution from democracy to tyranny can hardly be prevented by more and better education, nor can democracy be made workable by the plan of making everybody into a philosopher king. The advocates of this utopian dream completely overlook original sin, with its effects on the moral and intellectual qualities of man. As a result we see in all democracies the tendency to increase education quantitatively, primarily by an extension of compulsory education, but, in order to make it available to all, the standards are constantly reduced. Of course, once the PhD is made compulsory for all young Americans, there is already talk about an obligatory college education, American intellectual life will be annihilated. Indoctrination, in the narrow, exclusive, European sense of the term, on the other hand, trying to establish the common framework of reference directly or indirectly and to guard it jealously, will not only fail to establish a connection between the actual knowledge and that necessary to judge the great political questions, it will also prevent the formation of a necessary sovereignty of mind and the attainment of wider horizons. All it will accomplish is intellectual and spiritual inbreeding, if not total sterility. For these and other reasons a mass democracy is almost inevitable in any larger nation which is pledged to the democratic dogma. Some democratic Catholics took great comfort from the Christmas message of Pope Pius XII in 1944. Yet the Pope, dealing with a shibboleth democracy which in its popular connotation covers such a wide variety of ideals, institutions and political forms, merely outlined the sane and ethical forms of representative government as one example of many good forms of government. What the Pope had in mind is the parliamentary part of a mixed government, this is obvious from his reference to the possible monarchical alloy. The Pope did not underwrite democracy as we understand the term, he even took pains to point out that his condemnation of totalitarianism does not cover an absolute monarchy. The ethical evaluation of an absolute monarchy depends in each individual case on how accurately it aims at the common good, which includes respect for the freedom and the natural rights of man. Still, it is quite amazing to see what has been read into the pontiff's text. After making the observation that the irresponsibility of the dictators has evoked a general desire to control governmental action, he immediately launched into a distinction between the people and the masses, i.e., shapeless multitudes. He insisted that a mass democracy would be catastrophic, an extremely pessimistic statement, if we take the anti-personal mass character of our megalopolitan civilization into consideration. Then he attacked the concept of a mechanical equality, noting that inequalities ought not to obviate a spirit of union and brotherhood. Finally he laid great stress on the fact that, since the center of gravity of a democracy normally set up resides in this popular assembly, from which political currents radiate into every field of public life, for good or evil, the question of the high moral standards, practical ability and intellectual capacity of parliamentary deputies is for every people living under a democratic regime a question of life and death, of prosperity and decadence, of soundness or perpetual unrest. The fulfillment of these precepts seems to us out of the question in our present civilization. Certainly one of the elements which militates against the attainment of this goal is the mechanical egalitarianism so strongly condemned by the father of Christendom. Now if we look at the voters in the democratic polity we have again to distinguish between nations with, and nations without, the common denominator. In the former case we have in the parties mere ins and outs, and there is no good reason why individuals should not easily shift their allegiance between the two, or more, groups. The necessary flux of parliamentary government depends on the disloyalty of the shifters, to whom the choice of parties is a toss-up. Under such circumstances we will find citizens who, deeply convinced of the validity of the Acton formula, will vote on principle against any party which has been in power too long. This lack of security of tenure, in turn, often fosters graft and corruption, irresponsibility, and a petty bureaucratic mentality. Yet the greatest damage will be done in matters of foreign policy, which will follow a zigzag course depending on the outcome of the elections, cf. pages 159 to 160. This situation assumes a different character in ideologically divided nations, where we find opposing political philosophies which are fairly often coextensive with racial, ethnic, religious, or social groups. A follower of the re-reformed Dutch church will hardly vote for the Catholic State Party, or a Calvinist Magyar intellectual from the Danubian region for the Slovak Catholic People's Party. In the case of such a shift the accusation of treason would not be unjustified. The final logical deduction from the democratic dogma was made by the great Czechoslovak democracy, which exiled the Zudaten Germans en masse, 
three and a half million, one quarter of the population, for having voted Nazi in 1938. The Austrian political situation, of which we have spoken above, today seems to be as frozen as it was in 1920, all but two of the federated states and the federal government have a Catholic, conservative control with slight royalist and agrarian implications, while Vienna, a state as well as a city, is administered by a party which holds membership in the Second International and traditionally has a strong anti-Christian bias. Whereas the main support of the People's Party comes from the peasants, the upper middle classes and the clergy, the Social Democrats are primarily represented among the workers and of the lower bourgeoisie. Here we cannot expect much flux, and thus the democratic process in Austria lacks not merely the necessary conditions for a dialogue, but also the element of change. Only a mass hysteria can change this situation, the number of real converts being too small to affect the ratio of deputies materially. The dangers besetting democracies and forcing them down the path to tyranny are so numerous that we have to be critical of this form of government, not only on account of its intrinsic weaknesses but also for its evolutionary potentialities. It is also often precisely the claim of the democratic governments that they truly represent the general will which paralyzes the opposition against the ensuing totalitarian development of the state. Monarchs in the past, when tyrannically inclined, had to operate under much more difficult circumstances, the constitutional and psychological position of the Christian monarch was always a risky and tenuous one. Democracy, in its mobility and uncertainty, was always an entirely different proposition. Gonzo de Reynold, the brilliant Swiss historian, penned the following severe but unassailable judgment. The law of democracy is the law of numbers. But every government regulated by the law of numbers becomes a telluric phenomenon subject to its own fatality. This fatality consists in the fact that a moment will arrive in which it breaks loose from human control, from the lessons of experience, from the influence of reason. This is why democracy, a party individualistic from its beginning, arrived at what one calls today the government of the masses. This is why, after having been the regime of the bourgeoisie, it is becoming the rule of the proletariat. This is why, having been the postulate of liberalism, it becomes that of socialism. This is why, having turned into its own opposite, it preserves of its proper self nothing but the name, nothing but the label. We are fully conscious of the fact that the foregoing chapter so critical of democracy, yet written by a citizen of a European democratic republic, neglects to include a full comparison with other forms of government. The criteria we have examined include such items as reasonableness, morality, ethical pitfalls, human satisfaction, inherent dangers, and evolutionary directions. These should be applied to other simple or composite types of rule. Concerning this fact, we have to say that the present chapter contains only material for such further and necessary analysis. In the next chapter we will continue our investigation along these lines, singling out a specific form as a means of comparison. For this purpose we have chosen monarchy, because its historical record is the clearest and longest of all. The fact that no major work has been written about the monarchic idea, either in the USA or in Europe, acted on us as an incentive to deal more extensively with this political phenomenon, which has still such a dominating role in recorded history, and such a bad name in our myth-ridden age. And only the future can teach us whether monarchy, to the edification or the detriment of us all, will be able to say to our present-day parliaments and dictators the proud words. Time is yours, but eternity is mine.